Welcome to the lecture series Mobility Analysis and Planning for Human Scale Cities, organized by the Mobility Lab University of Tartu. And I'm Sirisi, and this lecture is organized together with Associate Professor Hage Bohm. Uh, today is the last lecture of this lecture series uh, this year. And uh, we have listeners both here on site and also online. Uh, welcome to both of you. And today's uh, lecture is uh, given by uh, Dia Labotna. Uh, she is the sociologist and sustainability researcher at the Karlsruhe Transformation Center of Sustainability and Cultural Change in Karlsruhe, Germany, and her focus uh, is urban transformations, urban climate and sustainability strategies regarding uh, local governance, participation, no knowledge uh, cooperation and uh, transdisciplinary research. And today she talks about the role of uh, experimentation in advancing uh, sustainable mobility practices within urban environments and introduce conceptual approach of uh, practice theory for under understanding mobility practices and their in interconnectedness uh, with other fields uh, of daily life. Uh, I'm very excited about uh, this lecture and uh, now I give the floor to Pia. Thank you very much for this invitation to the lecture. I have already been in Tartu visiting you. Now I'm happy to be there at least virtually. I'm um, Pierre Labonnier. I was already introduced, so I don't need to say any more. Um, I will, oops, no, I cannot. Um, I will start by providing you a short outline um, how I planned this lecture. So um, first, I would say some words what is it about, really basically, then um, on our research center, the Cultural Transformation Center for Sustainability and Cultural Change, and um, real world labs, a space for experimentation, learning and research on sustainable practices and transdisciplinary research. Um, then I will come to social practice theory for analyzing and understanding everyday mobility behaviors and give you some examples of experimentation as interventions in everyday life. Um, first self-experiments and then temporal intervention in public space. So what it is about. Um, cities um, face and need to address a multitude of challenges like relating to climate change, mobility, social inclusion, health. In this context, um, urban experimentation has prospered as a framework to enable innovation and transformation in cities. The basic question is, how do you get from knowledge to action? And um, there has been a dominant thinking on in looking at technologies, so what new technologies can help us with facing climate change? Um, yes, and other challenges, but it's a socio-technical change. We need to think technological and social change together. And even a big part and challenge in itself is how can we bring all these technologies, all these new approaches, in everyday life, how can we organize us in order to be more sustainable? And that's at the core of our research center, the Cultural Transformation Center for Sustainability and Cultural Change. It's part of ITAS, the Institute for Technology Assessment and System Analysis at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Karlsruhe, Germany. It is a research, education and development facility that operates itself a real world lab, which is called District Future um, Lab, and also various research projects. It um, exists since 2012, so more than 10 years already, but as CUT, it was funded in 2022. So these numbers are not right anymore, I just realized. So we are now 23 
scientists and a lot of students. What we want to do is to explore and promote sustainability transformation in all areas of society. So um, Oliver Parodi is head of our research center. Um, we understand ourselves as real world labs. The term real world laboratory originates from transdisciplinary sustainability research and found its way into scientific discourse in the early 2010s. The word combines the terms reality and laboratory, and thus it points directly to, um, to its conceptual core, to operate a laboratory, a scientific research and, and development infrastructure, and um, in the midst of reality. So we act in society in concrete, concrete lived reality and not as usually in science as an isolated building or facility cut off from its surroundings. Mm. So it's a format and further development of transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary research and um, entities at the interface of science and society. Um, real world, or in this respect, um, the concept of real world laboratory can also be seen, yes, at the further development. And um, it's organized, which is often organized, sorry, I came <laughs> out of concept. Um, it's transdisciplinary research is often organized in project form and rarely takes place in longer term research. And that's uh, how this um, redevelopment takes place. So it's a more uh, the idea of a long term facility of an infrastructure rather than having isolated labs. Um, real world laboratories conduct science in and with societies. So it's about testing new ideas, inventions and solutions and um, further develop them under real life conditions. And to this end, relevant social stakeholders and those who may be affected are directly involved in the work of a real world laboratory and um, transitional processes. Um, it's uh, it's thus um, conducting science for sustainability um, in a sense with a normative value-led research and also pursuing a creative claim of transformative research. Accordingly, this normative premises um, need to be analyzed, especially in real world lab research. So it's important to disclose them from the outset. Um, I would like to do an excurse to transdisciplinarity. I'm not sure if you are familiar with this concept. Um, transdisciplinarity describes an opening of science to real world problems, to the integration of non-scientific players, and to addressing the normative dimension of issues explicitly. So it takes a step away from this, yeah, seemingly not really neutral research um, to more normative stance because we have we want not only to do research on society but also to transform to bring society to a more sustainable state in um, transdisciplinary research we create different kinds of knowledge um, typically there are three types of knowledge system knowledge like it's quite a traditional scientific knowledge what is then target knowledge what ought to be and transformative knowledge which means how to get to this what ought to be so coming back to the real world labs they offer long-term support for transdisciplinary projects or experiments and align actors from science and practice. It's very strongly about learning, societal learning, also individual learning, and they open and keep space for experimentation and form a new transdisciplinary infrastructure. Like that's also what we call it lab. It's like a bit the idea of really having 
uh, research infrastructure, something that is there long term, like if you create a traditional lab. Um, in these real world labs, we conduct sustainability experience in a demarcated societal context. We stimulate transformation processes and give continuity to learning and scientific processes. There are nine essential characteristics of real world labs. So it's the research orientation, it's the normativity I already mentioned, and sustainability I mentioned, transformativity, so with the aim of having societal change to contribute to sustainable development. There's a civil society orientation to including practice partners from the beginning on, ideally really when defining the questions to include them already. Then a long-term perspective, a laboratory character to provide adequate um, conditions, a framework, and a model character. So they should ideally be transferable. Of course, it's um, it's difficult because it's very context related, but um, to some extent, it's possible. Then it's an educational facility also. There's a typical cycle um, of real world labs um, in which the actors from research and practice jointly go through three phases, co-design, co-production, co-evaluation, and produce these three kinds of knowledge, system, target, and transformative knowledge. Um, this flowchart is fundamentally based on the transitional distinction between a scientific field and practice field on the right. And, um, but actors from and the scientific field on the left. And um, actors from both fields come together in a scientific practical interaction in order to tackle a society, so socially relevant problem. So coming back to CUT, we define us as we World Lab as interface between science and society. To make it more concrete, um, we have since 2012 already a physical real world lab in Karlsruhe in one big city district, which an overall aim to exemplary come to a sustainability transformation of a typical European district. So we want to address all sustainability dimensions to to empowerment, to create a culture of sustainability. Um, we have a physical space there also, the Zukunftsraum or future space, um, which is our office and lab, but it's also a place for cooperation, also for different stakeholders there, um, for civil society groups, um, yeah, very, different kinds of groups like uh, food sharing groups, the um, yeah, Oststadtbürger, it's like a citizen association and um, or the grandparents for future, very different groups. Um, it's also about local consulting. So we have opening hours, people come there and can get consultation. Other groups like the um, Climate and Energy um, Agency of Karlsruhe can use it also, and it's a meeting point. We also have a mobile participation lab. It's like a tiny house on wheels where we can go close to where the people are. Because of course, even in our lab in a neighborhood, many people will not come. But like this, uh, we can go out and really come into interaction with people. We can do participatory research, um, very classical uh, empirical social science, but also science, science communication, transdisciplinary teaching. Um, it's a place for exchange and participation. And um, it's really like, for example, we do it besides a marketplace where people pass by. They can come and look and can get into discussion with us. Often they are quite fierce discussion, 
but I think it's really important for us to hear what the people say, get out of our bubble in our scientific world, and they can get with a very low threshold into contact with science. Um, just very briefly, CUT is a home base for different projects. Um, one project where um, mobility is also one part is Scala, the CUT's mobile world lab for sustainable climate protection, which aims to um, accompany, evaluate, help to realize um, climate protection measures in Karlsruhe. And um, together with 30, more than 30 practice partners, there are different fields of experiments, fields of action, like less car-based mobility, but it's just one of those. Um, we have also climate-friendly business travel, sustainable climate protection, building sector, um, specialists for climate protection and climate-friendly canteens. So it's like a real-world lab project as a frame for different um, experimentation. Uh, over this, or uh, yeah, another example is really to um, it's in the field of energy transition to provide um, balcony PV modules as a yeah artifact to people for testing out forms of integration into the energy transition. But now I come to the more theoretical part. Um, it was just to give you an impression of first um, entrance into the topic of experimentation. Um, for analyzing and understanding everyday mobi mobility behaviors, we need a, a certain lens, we need a conceptual frame. And one of these possible frames is um, the social practice theory. Um, <clears throat> um, first, to come back to mobility, um, mobility is a key field for sustainability transformation. It um, has a strong climate change related impact um, on emissions, air pollution, noise and land use. As you probably all work on mobility, you know that. But um, what I want to stress here that it's also a key factor for participation in social life labor market, everyday supply, and thus it's a really central aspect for urban sustainability. Um, it's not, yeah, it has different dimensions. So this ecological dimension um, to find climate friendly modes of transport, then need appropriate access to mobility services for all as um, social dimension, then economically to have an efficient use of resources and processes. Um, Yes, and then the question is how to understand and finally transform mobility, mobility patterns, practices. And um, mobility can be understood as consumption practice, following the Oslo definition for sustainable consumption, which is the use of goods and services that respond to basic needs and bring a better quality of life while minimizing the use of natural resources, toxic materials and emissions of waste and pollutants over the life cycle, so as not to jeopardize the needs of future generation. So um, mobility as consumption is acquisition of vehicles, um, the choice which vehicle you acquire, then the use of modes of transport, of transport related goods like fuel. Um, yes, yeah, so it's the, the it's and all this is fulfilling or responding to basic needs. You need to get from one place to the other. Um, social practice theory is an alternative approach to more individualistic, rational choice, cause effect, and social deterministic conceptualizations of human actions. So the focus here is more on, um, on the doings, on the ordinary, the routinized use of artifacts, technologies, and infrastructures, like looking more closely on cooking, on, on cycling, showering, heating, and for a better understanding 
of these practices in in their context as a pattern and also very, very strongly interrelated. So the question is what is involved when we perform a certain practice? So the idea here is that um, in rituals are, um, are the carriers of the practices. The practices exist to some extent without the no, they don't really exist without them, but they are performed by them. Um, a definition by Schaefer is therefore um, that practices are the actions, are actions, speech, feelings, and thoughts even that we necessarily share with others. So it's not something we invent ourselves, but it's it exists beyond us. The fact that we share them with others is a prerequisite for understanding the world. Because like this, it's um, it makes sense. We're making sense of it and we are able to act. Practices already exist before the individual, before the individual acts and they enable this action as much as they structure and restrict it. Um, they are not only carried out by us, but they exist all around us because there are many, many different carriers of these actions and they existed historically before us. They circulate independently of individuals and yet they are of course dependent of the, on the individuals. They are depending, dependent on being performed and performed by these individuals as carriers of the practices. Um, there are um, typically bundles of practices. Practices are not existing in themselves and practices are structured by um, meaning, skills, material and rules. In this example of in the research of um, Andreas Huber on co-housing, I think it's quite nicely illustrated. Um, so meaning refers to shared understandings and like that guide practices. In this example of poor housing, it's for example to experience community, to feel belongingness and empowerment, to yeah, to get practical support. That's why you go into this community. Then you need certain skills to perform the practices, like social skills, um, of compromise finding. Then you need financial, technical planning capabilities. Or coordination skills. Um, skills are forms of routinized um, know-how, so um, how to coordinate practices, how to coordinate what you do. Then rules are, for example, in this case, um, rules how to behave in this community, expectations, the expression of expectations, um, and um, material dimension is about the uh, highlights really this importance of um, physical surroundings of the infrastructure you can use of the um, yeah the objects you have at your disposal and um, like for example in this case um, to have a architecture that allows at the same time privacy but also community places for encounter. In, a, in mobility, it would, for example, be, do you have a um, cycling path? Do you have um, public transport nearby that you can use? Are you then, regarding skills, are you able to bike? Are you able to walk even? Are you... Um, and this is an example in the field of mobility. It's like, illustrating how um, in practice theory we can look at this everyday practices. Um, so we really would go into a daily routine and look at it more closely. Like, yes, in the morning we prepare breakfast, we prepare the kids. Then we bring the kids to kindergarten and go to work. If the kindergarten is nearby, it could be easy to just drop, go I don't know, by foot or by bike and drop them off, go to work. If both are far from each other and um, time is very short, for example, um, 
we might take the car or if we don't have a appropriate um, biking lane to going there. Then there's this question, do we need to go shopping in between? Um, if we need to transport big things, we might think, OK, we take the car. But if we have other ways of transport, like a cargo bike or a service to bring home the shoppings, we might still take the bike. Then we need to get back the kids. Perhaps we make a detour to the Nibay Lake. Is there a biking lane to go there or not? Do we have um, enough time to go in there by bike? Then we have this, um, on the one hand, really this material structures um, like, do we have public transport? Do we have an appropriate bike? Perhaps we make home office, we can make things easier. And to make it more complicated, we have the integration of dispersed practices that are related to it. For example, I like to, I prefer to go by car or by um, public transport instead of bike because I want to read in between. I want to use the time for, yeah, for working, which is also leading to a choice of public transport instead of car because it's difficult to read um, or to write something when you're yeah, driving a car. So it's like a, um, really this. I think it illustrates this interconnectedness of practices that can be very small things, but uh, which are related to each other and are somehow also explained or the choices are explained by this. Then the question is how change comes about. It's a, so the um, it comes about through the reconfiguration of practice elements, changes in the relationship of these bundles of the interrelated practices, and um, we can also experiment on changing these, for example, the material framing, the material conditions, or we can experiment with um, changes in performing the practices. Um, but I would like to come first um, to the bigger picture of changes. Um, the field of mobility is also a socio-technical system. So it, I think this, this, this more micro level theory of um, social practice theory and um, higher level theory are nicely complementary. That's why I come back to this level now. Um, yes, the field of mobility is a social technical system. And um, yes, when asking how change comes about, how the change we want to drive towards more sustainability, um, there are process theories describing the interaction of different analytical levels, like the multi-level perspective I want to shortly introduce here. Um, the change comes through the interactions between landscape as, exter as external structures at the micro level, then the regime, which is the dominant structure, the social technical configuration for filling societal functions, which creates also a rule set. Then the niche, which is the level of novelties, which is characterized by selection criteria diverging from the regime and um, which are space for learning and experimentation as well as for network creation. And here I'm mostly focusing then on niches and um, practices in these niches. The concept of niches is um, the term originates in biology, so as an ecological niche. It refers to factors of um, development and survival, like living conditions and role of species um, in the ecosystem, then um, the relationship of a species to its environment. Um, and the question of which environmental factors a species need and how they are used. Then it was introduced um, by Schumpeter and Spiegel in economic sciences and also to then towards social sciences, first as market niche. The term is used in quite different ways. 
Currently, it's widely used in transition research due to concepts like niche management, multi-level perspective, and um, often as a protected space for development and testing of new things, of learning processes, of network formation. In niches, we can demonstrate and test what is possible, we can create learning, trust, impulses. And even though it's, there's a strong context relatedness, this demonstration has impact beyond the individual local niche. There are, um, I refer to a concept of socio-technical niches. Um, traditionally, also in this niche, niche management or, or research on um, niches, technology was in the center. For example, in looking at how we came from sailing ships to steam. Um, but it's only one mean of fulfilling functions. Um, so there's a concept of local socio-technical niches, um, which are a specific local combination of structural elements in which new approaches for the fulfilling of functions are developed and tested. So the focus is more on how functions are fulfilled, how needs are responded to, and how this is done. It's not does not need to be a technology. It can also be a um, organizational change. And um, a whole socio-technical configuration is tested um, around um, structural elements like technical, ecological, institutional knowledge and social values. Um, such a niche, coming back to the real world labs I introduced at the beginning, are, um, yeah, the real world labs are niche and in these real life experiments can be realized. Um, real life experiments are a scientifically sound experimental approach in real world social everyday context. So it's important really to say it's a scientifically sound, so it's documented, it has rules, it has um, yeah, methods, specific methods. Um, but it can be different kinds of um, experiments, the testing and con contextualization of technical or social interventions, prototypes to generate system knowledge can also be about, yes, technologies in this case, but does not need to be. Then it can also be self-experiments in which individuals reflect on their own behavior, create a temporary change in their everyday practices how they um, yeah, um, have their daily lives. Um, can also be thought experiments like scenario workshops, serious gaming, um, having more like, for example, a visioning experiment. Um, here I would like to present two types. First, um, self-experimentation and then experimentation in urban space. Um, Self-experimentation are about experimenting for more sustainability and for changing everyday life on a trial basis. So it, they are supposed to make possible to reflect, to leave everyday routines and get new experiences, um, to try out things, discover new practices and um, also help to develop a sense of self-efficacy and the scope of action. So often, um, yeah, it's uh, difficult, even if you're really willing to change something, you're very strongly um, in your routines on the one hand. It seems difficult to change and it's a difficult question where to start. It's such, it's so big if you want to be more sustainable, where to start, what to do, and then often it can completely block you. Um, and there, the self, this idea of self-experimentation can really help to overcome this blockade, to, to get into action by a first small step. It can be a really small step. The format was created um, by us 
some years ago and it's really we use it very um, successfully, I would say, in different contexts. Um, we have different versions of this and try it out. Um, so the idea is really to, yeah, to go with people into an experimentation. It can typically be for one month. Um, so we, we don't um, want to prescribe them anything. We just want to like help them get an idea of what they could try out and how they could do it. So typically we go into a conversation on um, starting with, I'm sorry, this is now in German, the, the example, but um, to, to do a choice of where do you want to start, in which field, like habitation, mobility, um, yeah, food, for example. And then if they, for example, choose mobility, we ask, okay, how do you want to proceed? Um, there are different possibilities. I go back here, uh, it's not so good visible. Um, for example, this person chose engaging and communication. Um, it could also be to try out something new, to change my routines, to um, replace something by now, something else. And mobility, it could be, okay, I replace for four weeks um, the car by bike. I go every day for four weeks to work with my bike and just for testing if it couldn't work. Then um, we ask them to define their goals. It couldn't be to change something, to experiment, to learn, to just see how it could work. Um, and then the next step would be, okay, in a classical experiment, you document. Um, you document your progress, you document how this experiment works, also in between results. So this can be done by different, in different ways. For example, in this case, reaction of others. You can document how others react. If you go by bike to work every day, perhaps you get very positive reactions. Perhaps people say, ah, we are crazy. How can you do 12 kilometers um, every day? And uh, I don't know, you have a wife and you are sweaty or, yeah. Or they say, okay, nice, I um, join you, I also go by bike. And then we ask, um, who could join you in doing this? Because it's nicer to do something, not alone, but with others. And um, then they can, for example, here the person chose um, someone with whom I'm not on the same um, page. Who, for example, in mobility, says it's crazy to go by bike to work. Um, it does not work or it's too dangerous. I don't know. It could also be a person that is like minded or a person of my family. I want I, I perhaps need to integrate even because we do uh, the everyday um, mobility uh, together. Then um, we asked, OK, when you have uh, in four weeks, you have finalized this term of trial. What do you do then? For example, this person said, um, yes, to activate also others, to um, yeah, bring it out into the world. You can also get politically active because perhaps you encounter difficulties that are structural difficulties. There are no biking lanes. Biking lanes are really bad. Um, there are dangerous spots on your way, um, things like this or you, you chose to go by public transport, but you only have public transport every hour, or the connections do not work, for example. So it's about creating this kind of helping people to get getting into experimentation, to living in different experience and to yeah enable them, to encourage them to do it differently. At the same time, like this, we can discussing with them and documenting this, we can understand a bit better where are the challenges in all this, where are the hindrances to change something, which can be very, very small things you don't automatically think about, and which are really rooted in these everyday routines and these practices 
that are strongly linked together. And this link as such can be a hindrance, a barrier. Um, it can also, this can also be in a, done in a more um, collective way. We had a project called Daring Climate Protection Together um, with the goal to, do, uh, to realize uh, CO2 savings at an individual level um, in everyday life, but um, as a group. So setting goals together, documenting together, and um, train, doing trainers from multiplayers of these sustainability practices. Um, we had different fields. We had means of um, yeah, documenting all this. People came together. It was a very, like this first self-experimentation I presented. It's rather first a bit individual. People try for themselves. Here it's really this social component can help, of course help a lot to do something together, to reflect together on this. Very practically, um, it's also about, I said, we have this material dimension. It's not only about what I think would be good, what I would like to do, but I need the mean to do it. I need the structures. So um, one little thing is we um, provide uh, different kinds of cargo bikes. People can try them out because it's quite expensive to buy one. And if, if you don't really know if it's really use, useful in your everyday life, um, it can be a quite, quite a big barrier to do this. But it's also we also address uh, like little shops, little businesses. Who can use them um, for transporting things and um, for can hand, yeah, the um, materials, for example, people going to homes and repairing things. And um, they can try it out for, for some time for free if they document what they're doing with it. So it's a, again, research. We can, like this, we can explore, we can observe, and people can work on their. Can, yeah, can try things out. It, it's not about um, being successful in all cases. We also had um, people who said, okay, I tried it out. It does not work. It's not good for me, but then I can try out something else. At the end, I know I'm, I have learned something. Can also be a failure. It's also okay. Then the second, um, sort of experimentation I um, announced in the beginning I would talk of is experimentation in urban space. So in this example, it's more the bottom up thing. Um, I guess I think it's a European wide um, yeah, event. Perhaps you know the parking day, um, one, one kind of uh, experimentation urban space is really to occupy parking space for other uses to show how nice it would be to have less cars taking all the space in the city and um, use it for coming together, for doing something together, for the children to play and showing somehow, somehow it works. Um, we had a very, very, very dense, dense we habitated neighborhood here with many cars, cars. Every attempt to free the bit of cars was um, faced by a lot of um, conflict, of protest. It works on the parking day. It works worked also because there was a building site for months. It worked very well, but people need to, to, to live it, to experience it for being able to um, imagine that it could work and that it could be quite nice differently. It can also be, the result could also be, okay, in the space it does not work because there are people living who really need their car, they need to, yeah, to have it nearby, there are no alternatives, could be. But in many cases, I guess it will show that it works and that it's nice. So this is more bottom up, it's created by initiatives, um, then we have um, a more top-down sort of experiment. Um, 
which, for example, in Karlsruhe, it came from the city of Karlsruhe. They took up this idea of real world lab idea and adapt, adapted it to the city. Um, it was not really corresponding to how we define the concept, but still it's nice that, yeah, the people in the city administration see this possibility and use it and also dare to do it because um, it's, it's a risk also. And they get, of course, a lot of controversies around it. Um, here they closed a very central street in the inner city for, um, for cars. So they, for several months, cars couldn't go there anymore. And uh, like a inner, like it's also in the inner city, a passage, Kaiser Passage. It's um, a space where also a lot of cars passing by, going to shops, going to um, yeah, other places, places like uh, doctors, um, pharmacy. So it's it's uh, it's not really easy. It was quite, yeah. I think they dared something to close it down, but it worked quite well. In one of the cases, which you see on the white, um, the Kaiser Passage. Now it's um, after trying it out, there was a decision to close it. Yeah, forever to recreate the space as a space where you really can can be. Where you have um, places for sitting, for coming together, for dancing. Um, the other place in the street is more controversial. Um, yeah, it might be closed down, but it was really like a experimentation from above. Showing how it would be or how it could be without cars passing by. Because what you often have in this discussion, I guess you know it, um, that people take it for granted. The cars are there, they will every be, ever be there. It, it's not possible differently. So it's important to show that it's possible differently. So um, while self-experimentation makes it possible to abandon established routines, adopt new perspectives, and uh, trying out things that are really direct, quick, giving a quick um, success um, for learning on the own experience. Um, here it's uh, more collective learning, um, joint experience of something of a change in our living. So surroundings. Um, this concept of real world labs of experimentation has also been taken up by the German federal level. So it's something and um, yeah, that's really developing. Um, in this case, they on the starting point is, for example, I look at cities. Cities, um, if they want to experiment, it's really difficult. It's difficult for them to change something because of the very strong legal restrictions. To change something, they get very, very fast into legal fields. They get into risk. They don't know if they can do it. So the idea is to um, create the possibility for more temporarily and spatially limited test spaces to to have more room for maneuver, for more room for experimentation, to create experimentation clauses in all laws, for example. Um, yes, because of this diagnosis that laws and regulations are too rigid. Um, in this, from the German federal governments, for example, it's a strong um, focus on technology and especially in digital field, but it's not only about this. Um, and they want to flank it by a one-stop shop for real-world labs as central point of contact to um, get support, um, for example, on understanding what you can do. Um, and they want to do a mandatory experimentation clause check in legislation. Um, on European level, you have also something similar. I don't have a slide on this now, but like it's more technology related on these sandboxes. Perhaps you have heard of this. It's coming, came out of this uh, German real world lab idea. 
you have also since a longer time um, the concept of living labs. I get this is more widely known. We have the users, um, public actors, knowledge institutions, private actors um, doing a process of research and experimentation together in a real life context. And instead of long conclusions, I think I already gave you some. Coming back to this uh, starting point of how can we get from knowledge to action. Um, I hope you saw that it's really complex, but that there are means to look more closely at um, how it comes about on um, understanding of um, where are the barriers, where are the leverage points also for change. So they are on different levels. If you have used the multi-level perspective, you have more the bigger picture, you have can understand this interaction of the different levels, but you also need to know how in everyday life change comes about. And for this practice theory helps to understand better these patterns of practices, the interlinkages and um, yes, how on the one hand they are stabilized, how they are performed, but also how they change because people perform and they have some freedom of performing them. But they still need uh, to get more explicit in step two. So we know where we want to go, we know what we need to realize, what we need to change, what challenges we have, but how to come in a better state, that's still a complex challenge. So if you want to know more about us, there are different ways to get information. And thank you. Thank you, Bia. I think it was a very nice overview of the both sides, the theoretical and also the practical examples of how you have used it. But now we have, I have a lot of questions, but, uh, but I asked before for our students that they have some questions. Just specifically, <coughs> what kind of research topics can be this? Uh, can you hear? Yeah, yeah can yes. you hear? Sorry. <laughs> uh, so. What kind of other topics can this real world lab methodology use? Um, so, in general, you mean? In general, so, for yeah. example, so for example, what we currently work also on is um, um, food systems. Um, we have learned a lot from uh, working on the energy transition, on mobility. There's a lot of research already on mobility patterns, but we also face more and more strongly challenges regarding food, how to have a more sustainable food system. And what we, for example, do is uh, to re reconfigure the local and regional food chains to see, okay, what um, new intermediary um, actors would be needed, what uh, different processes, where are the barriers to um, supply, for example, um, public canteens with local food. And then really to, to see, okay, how can we re reconfigure, what could we test out to change this food supply chains. This is, for example, another topic we are quite strongly working on. Or, um, for example, to um, like one element was introducing repair cafes. Um, I guess you know them. They are now widely um, yeah, introduced in different cities. So not to throw away your things, but to provide a possibility to repair your things. And um, to do this together, and to create uh, structures where you can go with your broken things to repair them. And it quite strongly has, a, it has quite a strong potential for changing consumption patterns. I hope it met your question. 
I did not understand everything. Great, there we go. I have more questions? Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Pia, uh, for this mm -hmm. uh, very comprehensive overview. Um, mm -hmm. And I also very much enjoyed the, um, the different levels of those real world labs that you pointed out, uh, starting from uh, self experimentation. Uh, to then more uh, to, to those um, urban scale experimentations where which can come from bottom up or top down mm -hmm. initiatives. So it was like a really nice, uh, nice outline uh, of, of, of this concept. So uh, when you were talking about self experimentations, so I, I got to think that. So first, it's such a nice uh, methodology uh, about understanding the self and um, reflecting on it, perhaps leave some practices, become, pick up other practices. Um, but I was thinking, was is like the the uh, more general aim so that the same people would stick to these practices themselves and try, try to reorientate themselves in the existing system? Or is it also something that if you have identified within those experimentations, some aspects that have uh, that should be like changed on an urban scale or in a transport system scale so that you bring that knowledge to those uh, yeah. authorities responsible parties and so that the change can also be facilitated from their side mm -hmm. yes it's also about this it's on the one hand it's really for those who do it to lift this change to see they can change something and then also people in there's the warnings that they see it's possible. But it's also about coming from so-called footprint, your own footprint, what you can do to this uh, concept of handprint, we call it, like really to um, explore what barriers there are and then um, to go to the political field and see what needs to be changed in order to enable people to change, to, to act, yeah, to live differently, to change their behavior. So it's really very, very strongly about this step also. And that's something which is newer also, that it really still needs work to have this transfer from the own individual footprint, changing something in your everyday life to the transfer of this knowledge, which is created also like this, to the political level, to different actors who can do then structurally something about it. And it really gives, um, that's also our scientific part, because it creates knowledge, data on these aspects. Yeah. So, so and, have you started? Yeah. Sorry. No. Continue, please. I, I just, I wanted to add something to the question before. One experiment we have here is also, I mean, in the field of mobility about autonomous mobility. So, um, like trying out to have these little buses going around and um, in a neighborhood and then see how it works, how people react, how they use it. That would also be a very concrete example of one real world lab we have here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pia. And just now, like a follow up also to this, that have you yourself also established those pathways, how you can bring this knowledge? to those responsible parties or those policymakers, uh, authorities, or uh, or is it still something to, to work, work out, to figure out what could be those uh, transferable uh, practices here, how, uh, how knowledge that we have been creating or you have been creating uh, as a research institution, as a co-creation and research, research institution to those, you know, policymakers. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like the knowledge, exists. knowledge um, transition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, this knowledge ex transition gap, I would say it still exists, but um, we work on it. For example, there is a project called Climate Challenge, which really explicitly works on this link between the, yeah, the self-experimentation and the handprint and how to bring these learnings to the political level. So I think it's very strongly about transdisciplinary research to have these actors with you. So we work with different institutions in the city very closely together 
to do to do workshops to discuss together um, around very specific aspects like um, fostering biking in the city or um, fostering a car free city it's really to to bring these experiments to the local decision makers through different formats um, yes i think this can especially if you look at the more larger scale national or european i think this can be really still strengthened but i think it's really a yeah it's a strong side of transdisciplinary research because it's in the def definition itself, in the concept, it's really that you are not staying as a researcher there, but you work together, formulating questions, having a whole process of um, evaluation, of um, testing things out together. Okay, thank you. Uh, a little related to this, uh, previous questions that uh, do you have some very concrete or specific examples of the results what is it have what have you put uh, uh, from uh, which is related to this uh, social practice theory it means that the other theorist doesn't brave it or it doesn't give us to, to do the interviews or the uh, surveys but to just to using this uh, space of this uh, practice theory that this is some mm -hmm. very spe special results or what you can't uh, get no uh, without this. Do you have some examples of this uh, results? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, for example, mobility is really good field for this. Um, really to, if you have a group of people who have the goal together for two weeks to live without a car, um, like this, you can really have them um, document in their everyday life how they live this, how they encounter this, um, how it works or where it perhaps does not work. Um, it's really about um, or at what points, for example, when, I don't know, your child needs to go to an outside place for the hobby or really this small leverage points which need to be changed to understand this. I think it's also very late, related to this aspect of leverage points, to this points of um, blocking, but also to leverage points, to leverage change, to um, understanding the barriers and, but also the motivating factors. Um, yes, I don't know if it's clear enough. So it's really about um, exploring or observing first. Um, we have also studies um, that done by Elizabeth Shaw, for example, on this um, showering practices, like or heating practices. Um, why and when people put on the heating or do not put it on because um, they can also just be in one room. They don't need it in the other. Or um, they they need to shower. If they go to work by bike, they need an additional shower. It's also like um, these very small interlinked practices, and which is on the one hand, for example, if you go by bike to work, you're very sweaty. It's also about like a, um, a norm how you should be at work. I don't know if it's clear. So it's all this very interlinked thing, small things you would first not think about that you can detect by this. But and have, have better you... understand. Because often people say, okay, I want to be sustainable. But okay, what does it mean? It's not only because you want to do something that you will do it. We see it every time people know what would be right, but they don't, do not do it. So it's important to understand why don't they do it or why others do it. And it's not only about your mindset and how, if you think climate protection is important or not, it's also about how you live and what, um, yeah, 
configuration of all these practices you are. Uh, practices and um, dimensions, like your material dimensions, meanings, um, social rules. Is yeah, I think this is a, yeah, I think it's a good, uh, this is a practice theory, it's like uh, taking together the different aspects uh, and, uh, and mm -hmm. interconnects this. But, but when, when you're doing these experiments, as I understood, there is like uh, lasting uh, four weeks to some experiments and then you mm -hmm. uh, start. But the, how it is, have you started to, to, to after that, how, how this change is like permanent or they go back to this mm -hmm. uh, previous practices or, or how it is, uh, have you studied it that uh, which, mm -hmm. uh, maybe which, which sort of people is, uh, is the same that they stay there or, or, or what it, um, how it is influenced mm -hmm. of this motivation or, or something else that, that, that the change would be uh, permanent after this, mm -hmm. uh, your experiments. Yes, what we found, so we did also um, ask people sometimes afterwards, and what is has the most strong effect is if it's um, done by a group and if we enable people to be multipliers also. Like um, not only enabling them to do something for themselves, but also giving them some means, some um, methods, some ideas to bring it to their social groups. For example, um, someone did then small um, experiments or small workshops in their um, working environment or in a school or in their um, association. And this is something um, to, to be not alone with it, but you see you can also bring it to others and they join you. That's a quite strong element for success. So, um, of course, often after these four weeks, it's not automatically that people proceed with it, but many do because then they really saw it works. And um, it's really like a tipping point or a leverage point, this aspect of um, experiences, experiencing that you can do it. Or for example, ah, one field is also like food, um, getting from eating less meat, for example, because this is a very yeah, strong leverage also for climate protection, how much meat you eat. And for many, at least here in Germany, it's very natural to eat meat every, every day. They just think meat belongs to your natural um, food. But to see that it works without it, you have alternatives. You can just eat more vegetables, it's nice. It, it works quite well also to proceed afterwards with it because it's really strongly about seeing that it works, that you can do it. But how, how, what, do, what do you think is this, uh, who is participating in your experiments? Is it some selected group of people who is, I, I, I would mm -hmm. estimate that, that, that they are somehow uh, would like to do this change or they, they would like to experiment or they are not against of these things what you are experimenting and this is like mm -hmm. more one step further for this uh, to change because they yeah. are already thinking of or they are what you think it is like very selected group or they are more like wide or how you feel it is like uh, giving this uh, results for that, uh, not to say the whole population, but for different uh, groups of people. Mm. Yes, it's it's mostly a quite selected groups of people who, it's very different people. It's not just academics or really engaged people, but of course there's some pre-selection normally because people who are have some interest to change something and perhaps just don't know how to do. We also, especially as we go with our mobile participation lab, we go really into neighborhoods. We have some reach out to people who wouldn't do it or yeah, wouldn't get the idea um, without approaching them. Or we also go to schools, for example, um, and there or to enterprises um, to to yeah to very different locations. Or we go where elderly people meet or. Um, yeah, to use, for example, 
existing meeting bases of people to approach them who would not approach us, who would not be interested. Or um, then you have the effect also that people who do it, they are also in different social contexts. So they bring it into their family, they bring it to their relatives and they confront other people with it who are not interested or perhaps first not open and they also see it can work. So that's there's a multiplier effect also how you can reach them. But it's it's still um it's still a kind of niche and um that's something we work on really on how to bring it into a really wider society. I think that's a key challenge of um yeah, of sustainability transformation to find this links to a wider society to be more inclusive with all this to yeah engage many more people in all this and to to really link to the needs of and perspective of these people and address also um, different yeah capabilities different uh, knowledge um, dimensions different. Yeah, living realities of people. That's not easy. Maybe it's like a start of this uh, snowball that, that, that is yeah. starting as yeah. mm -hmm. communities and then a wider, wider group of uh, people. Do we have some more questions here? No, we can have one more way of the questions. Perhaps I just wanted to reflect on one, uh, one thing, uh, Pia. Just last week, uh, here with our students, we we tried to also like conceptualize all the uh, lectures that have been here last uh, like this year and last years uh, by using the social practice theory, and we used the, the competencies or skills, uh, the meanings, the materials, and then we were just thinking together where would we place the regulations, the rules, and so it was nice to see you or the Hoover uh, 2017 uh, reference, I think it was. Uh, like identifying rules as the fourth pillar of this social practice theory. Mm -hmm. so, so in a way, it was like a response to a question that we jointly had last week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one more also thing that I have thought about is that how you have leveled it like this. I see that then it's like an individual level or of all, all of this uh, uh, social practice theory elements and then it's like a community level which is the, as the rules also there is like a personal rules and then it's like community rules and state level and these are on a different levels no. have, have you some to take into account this that also the barriers are, are I think on these different levels uh, on uh, on and, and this influence uh, mm -hmm. people differently 